fish we've been fishing for. He pulls it up. It's a freaking walleye. We can at least try to leave whatever corner of paradise you call home water better than you found it. Seeing the gears going in, in somebody's first time out there fishing, and you get somebody doing something like that. Organizations like Casting for Recovery and Real Recovery, um, they hit real close to home for me. Welcome to Wildlife Outdoors with your host, Russell and Jose. If you have a passion for conservation of the outdoors, or you're enjoying a calming hike in the mountains, an exhilarating kayak trip on the river, feeling a fish on the end of your line, cooking on an open flame in a primitive campsite, or stalking big game, just waiting for the perfect shot, you're in the right place. So put on your boots and polarized sunglasses and come along for the ride. Welcome back to another episode of Wildlife Outdoors. I'm your host, Russell, and we got an important guest on here that I am excited to talk about. We've been trying to schedule this for a while. Unfortunately, Jose wasn't able to make it on this episode. You know, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of moving pieces, but we have a guy on today who is a guide, small business owner. He lives up in the Ozarks, which I freaking love up there, uh, but his name is Josh Darguzis. We like to call him Goose. How you doing, man? I'm, as I've told many people, I'm upright, conscious, and Somehow still breathing involuntarily. Um, yeah. Well, I'm happy yeah. to have you on, man. We talked quite a bit, I think probably like 45 minutes before we even started recording. So <laughs> let's see if we can kind of duplicate some of that conversation, I guess. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we, we got talking about conservation and fly fishing and guiding in, in Arkansas. So uh, yeah, man, I guess we can get started with that. <laughs> right. So uh, I guess we could start with just a background of yourself. You know, how, how did you get started into fly fishing? So I've actually been fly fishing for, though, I, I did the math today with a buddy of mine. And it's been 10 years. Um, oh, my wow. Cousins, yeah, they, they're, so my one cousin, Jim, uh, his wife, who is, she's the one from, you know, Alaska. Um uh-huh. They were the ones who got me into it. They they set me out in the yard and in southern Missouri, and they were like, you know, grab this whippy stick and start playing with it. And I was like, <laughs> all right, cool. So I'm over here like Indiana Jones cracking power lines, birds. There wasn't a tree safe around. And <laughs> it, it it set something in motion that I wasn't ready for, um, yeah. which was undoubtedly financial instability. Like it, <laughs> <laughs> it became such a passion and addiction um, I still gear fished on and off, but fly fishing became kind of this quintessential thing to me that, you know, it, it you can never perfect it, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. And you can always find something to improve on. It makes fishing a little bit more rewarding. It's like driving a, driving a stick, you know, yeah. you, you, just, you get to be more in tune and more, more in control of what's going on. So um, years rolled by. And I'd done a little bit of trout fishing, done a little bit of bass fishing on the fly. And then you find your home water. Like, you, you know, you, you come to the Ozarks or, you, you know, you find a river within it that it becomes something that you weren't ready for. And you start smacking fish left and right, hand over fist, big fish, small fish, doesn't matter what it is. And then you start to get to play around with, you know, like, oh, cool. You know, let's go grab a three weight. Let's go grab an eight weight and check streamers, whatever it was. And it just spiraled unhinged off the rails. I mean, there's there's no stopping the undoubted love that came with this sport. Absolutely. And and I feel like that's you. You said that you weren't ready for it. I feel like that's the case for everybody that gets hooked into fly fishing like that that's always it whether it be oh you know i'm gonna try this out and then you catch your first fish and you're like holy shit like this is fun i can actually feel every head shake or it goes into you know fly tying you're like oh i'm gonna buy some materials to save some money next thing you know you spent 10 times more than you would have just to buy the flies but now you can tie anything for the rest of your life so (laughs) it's always a slippery slope and it's always like you're hooked and you're in it (laughs) the worst thing is I, so I had somebody ask me, they're like, how expensive is fly fishing? I was like, I, I got a buddy who's on a second divorce, like, <laughs> it, you know, or there was one guy who's like, I want to get into it. And I've told this story before. It's like, I want to get into fly fishing. Like, are you married? It's like, yeah. I'm like, get ready to get served papers. He's like, wow. I was like, it, it can become an addiction. He's like, well, she's still with me. He's like, I want to get into fly town. I was like, you do, man. He's like, he keeps saying that. I was like, there's three addictions. You got fly fishing, fly tying, 
and collecting fly tying materials mm-hmm. because you're like, I want to tie just a dozen of this, but you buy so much material because you're like, I'm going to screw up or I'm going to, you know, tie more down the road. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, that was olive when I started and now it's just olive and dusty <laughs> and here, take this. It, it's wild, man. Like there is such an addiction that becomes unhinged. And when you start to look at the prices, when you first start off, you're like, man, that's expensive. And now you're like, man, ramen noodles sound really good because <laughs> that, you know, that new line or whatever, it, it just, it, it is an addiction and I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, I agree with that a hundred percent. That's why you got to get good at your craft and then you can pick up a sponsorship or a pro staff deal and then you get discounts and then you can justify it a little easier. <laughs> yeah. You justify it, but you wind up with three times as much crap and you're like, I don't even know. I had like my buddy gave me a rod today. He's like, isn't this yours? I'm like, I don't know. He's like, I don't have a five weight like this. I'm like, I guess he's like, you're the only one who would have left a rod at my house. I'm like, I guess it's mine then. Sure. I, I don't remember it, but okay, cool. If it's not, it is right. Not. That's almost like finding a 20 in your jean pocket. <laughs> yeah. Right. I found a butt section of a three weight that was actually mine. And I'm like, hell, I've been looking for this. <laughs> like little squirrel stashes and shit everywhere. Dude, I found a, uh, a fly line in my toolbox the other day that one of my buddies had given to me years ago. It's a, it's actually a OPST shooting head for spay. And it's it was in my toolbox. I was like, the heck is this? I was like, holy crap, I forgot my buddy gave me this. <laughs> I was like, I need to get out. Have you like used it a bunch? No. So I've gone out maybe three times with the spay rod. I have a 14 foot 11 weight. Okay. And I bought it because when they generated the dam here, you can catch striper in the generation. And yeah. so I bought it for that. I was like, oh, I'm going to throw these huge flies, these massive articulated flies, get a shooting head, learn how to spay cast and try to get some striper. And I've been out there three times and all three times I've been committed. Like I'm going to learn yeah. the snap T I'm going to get it out there. And I, I got the cast down. Yeah. Um, but after three times of trying to teach myself and finally nailing the cast and not getting one hit, I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead there's, and put this aside until I know I can do it. <laughs> there's a gentleman, uh, his name is Michael Hatcher, and I linked up with him a while back, and he he's a spay fisherman through and through. And we were fishing in Missouri, and he's like, you know, he's got this big old two-handed rod, and he's like, you know why uh, why guys fish spay? And why steelhead fishermen fish spay? I was like, no, he goes, so they have something to do when they're not catching fish. And I'm like, man, that just <laughs> describes fly fishing for me. Like, yep. I, I suffer from castration. <laughs> like, I, I Dude, here, I've like, never heard that, but I love it. Yeah, it's like, oh, that's not good enough. Or I love doing single hand spay. And you sit here and, like, that was good. Uh, whatever. I'm just going to do it again. Like, <laughs> I, I spook a fish for, you know, I don't know. It's just a feeling. I enjoy it. <laughs> Yeah, there's been some times when I'm out there on the wash tar or something, I'm not catching anything, and it's like, all right, well, I guess this is time to work on my cast, work on my double haul, and once you just nail it, and you get that perfect layout, and especially when you're casting, you know, a big articulated fly, and it's catching wind, and, you know, you've done a few false casts trying to nail the timing, and so it's dry, and it's picking up, and you still just get that perfect layout, it's like, that was what I needed. (laughs) You know what happens right after you do that? You You don't catch anything. No, you hang oh, a tree. Like the, you I watch that. Yet. Yeah, you, you <laughs> watch that. No, like on the forecast, like you're like, I'm going to pound the bank. And, Why? and you're like, oh, that felt so good. You're watching that loop like sneak up on itself. And you're like, yeah, shit. That, that hung a lot lower than I thought. Okay. <laughs> I've done that before. And it's still heartbreak. It's still heartbreaking. I broke a sage, a six weight sage. Um, so what happened was I tied this fly and it was one of my first, uh, like just self tied. I saw something I want to tie it and I took my GoPro, put it underwater and saw some bass fry, you know, okay. running from or like swimming from a larger, a larger fish. And, um, I noticed that when they swam, they flared their gills and I was like, Ooh, I could probably incorporate that in the fly. So I, I tied this really awesome. Like it was probably maybe two, maybe three inches long a craft for bass fry fly. And okay. I was real impressed with myself because I put the little like gill flare in it. So I put some, uh, yeah. 
I, was, I think I want to say it was cactus chenille or out where the where the gill plate would be. And I just I I colored it with marker. Like, dude, it looked just like a freaking uh, a largemouth bass fry. And so I put my GoPro after I tied it up, put my GoPro underwater and I swam it by and pulled the footage. I said, dude, that looks just like a freaking bass fry. So I was so excited. I was like, I'm going to go fish this. And I found this hole over in this body of water here in hot springs that feeds into Lake Catherine. And um, I was like, there's bass in that hole. And yeah. it's just a cliff side on the other side. And there's some fallen trees and stuff where it's falling in. And I was casting and, and that fly got stuck. And I was like, I'm getting that damn fly. Like, I'm not <laughs> letting that fly go. I just freaking thought, like, I haven't caught anything on it. And so I'm like holding my rod up and I'm trying to work my way around this hole to try to get to that cliff side. And I was going to like try to scale the cliff to go try to get my fly. And I slipped and fell. And the tension was on the rod. and It, it snapped that sage in two places. And I was just like, and this was a few years ago, and I reached mm -hmm. out to Sage to try to get it repaired. And they, I don't know if they are now, but at the time, they weren't doing repairs. So I have a four-piece Sage that's in seven pieces sitting over here. <laughs> it's just a travel rod now is all. Right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's going to be it. the new up-and-coming thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, did you get the fly back, though? No. <laughs> 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 nope i uh i i ended up cutting the line i was able to pull the line enough to where i could cut the line but i couldn't reach the fly and like i said it was on a cliff side and i just could not get up high enough to grab that tree and then i ended up walking my way around getting on top of the cliff trying to see if i could get down to it and no it was right in the middle couldn't grab it yeah it was uh didn't get the fly back and broke my rod <laughs> <laughs> i i had a pretty embarrassing one which i i don't know how but i think i wound up with another tip section for it which doesn't matter because Somebody else broke the next section down. Um, but I was sitting there. I was fishing with my buddies like when we first met. And I fired this cast upstream and sitting there. And he's like, man, that's a deeper hole up there. I was like, yeah, I just wanted to drift. Oh. Okay, I'm hung up. So I'm roll cast and I'm doing everything I can to get this fly back just because I didn't want to pop it or deal with any of that shit. And um, I go, I think I fired like two or three roll casts at it. And my tip section of my TFO just shot off. I'm like, this is what I get for standing too close to a diesel exhaust as a child and not learning how to put my rod together, right? <laughs> and uh, so I go walking upstream of it to try and unhang the fly and get my rod hooked in at least one of the eyes. And my buddy's kind of downstream, like playing catcher. I'm like, okay, this is going to work. So I'm sitting here and I'm pulling tension and I'm letting slack off and pulling tension, trying to just get it to pop. And the next thing I know, I feel it let loose. And I'm like, wait for it. Just feel like a tick or something where it's hitting the eyes. And I pop the fly off, but unbeknownst to me, I snapped it off and I'm peeling it up. And he's like, huh, huh, huh. and I hold it up. I was like, I got shit, dude. And he's like, oh, I guess we're done fishing for the day. No, but you can fish longer. I don't know how, but I, I, he was giving me like a, a rod that I didn't know was mine. He's like, there's five pieces there, though. I was like, this has to be the tip of my TFO. I was like, did you randomly go and find that somewhere over in that? He's like, no, I don't know if I trust that. And if you did, thank you. But I need the middle section now. So TFO. <laughs> what what kind of rod is it? What, what model? It's actually, it was the first fly rod i ever got was mm. a tfo lefty cray pro 2 an eight foot uh -huh. six four weight it has been my workhorse for the first rod i bought was a bass pro dogwood canyon the first one that was ever like a a rod that was gifted to me and it was a birthday present you know like my old man was like you know you get into fly fishing like you know here and it's it, it's a hundred and fifty dollar rod at the time and if it wasn't for that lifetime warranty, I don't know if I would have ever fished with it. Like I've, I've broken it more times than any other rod. And I just, I beat the shit out of it throwing, you know, articulated flies on a four weight, which doesn't work very well. Um, <laughs> it, it just, it's been through the ringer and I love it to death. Yeah. I, uh, I broke the tip of my six weight Axiom 2X, uh, about a month ago fishing for carp out here. Ended up catching a mimosa tree on a back cast and came forward and snap. I said, Damn. Actually, no, I lie. I broke I broke the uh not the tip section, but the section below that. And uh, it broke yep. right at the ferrule where it connects to the tip section. And um 
I was able to order one and, and it came in and it, it was in, in like a week and a half or maybe yep. even less I mean, than that. Like it came in fairly fast. So um, replaced yeah. it and, and it's been great. And I've actually caught more carp and koi on it since. So, <laughs> man, it, it is one of those things, anything anymore, like it has to have a lifetime warranty because I, I'm going to break it. I mean, yeah. it, it doesn't matter what it is. It's going to get broken. Um, I, I actually had a buddy, he was on a trip. He had a client break two rods in one day. And I was really? like, Oh, that one, that one hurts. Like, yeah, yeah, it was, it was an expensive day. I was like, I've never had anything that bad, but I mean, we've, we've broken our fair share of shit and it's like, you know, we're, we'll, we'll cry about it later when right. we're eating ramen noodles again. <laughs> like we need right. to, it, we really need. So speaking of clients, so obviously you're a guide up there on the Spring River. So you want to talk a little bit more about that and kind of dive into the, the process and any crazy experiences you may or may not have had out there? We've had crazy experiences, but I mean, it, you know, there's a certain type of person who's going to fish in Arkansas. Like it generally the people we take, they're just blue collar, good people through yep. and through. Um, Unless you're on the White do, River. I don't know. I've seen some pretty, I've seen some good folks out there. Yeah, there, but, there are some good folks out there, but you do yeah. get the ones that aren't out there as well. <laughs> I only get to say that because I don't fish white that much. Uh, I'm, right. I guess I'm going to get crucified after this for saying that, but <laughs> no, I, I don't fish the white Norfolk as much as I should. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I, I really haven't met a, a bunch of disagreeable people. Um, I, I've come across assholes, but at the same time, that that's, yeah, that's life. I mean, you just you get people that. I had a buddy who had a gun pulled on, you know, it's really? like, yeah. I mean, he was telling me the story about fishing this hole. And he's like, yeah, no, I had a gun pulled on me there. I'm like, over what? And he goes, cause I was fishing there. All right. So yeah, you're going to, you're going to come across disagreeable people, but yeah. the large majority of people, if not everybody, you know, that we've taken, like they're either the strong silent type, you know, they, they don't talk much, but you can see like they're, they're hooking up. They're having a good time. The yeah. other ones, and it's the hardest one, is when people are like, I just want to catch fish. And it's like, okay, but but how? Like, do you do you want a streamer fish? Do you want a dry fly fish? Do you want a nymph? Do you want a high stick nymph? Do you want an indicator nymph? Like, what what do you want to do? What type of fish would you like to catch? And they're like, any fish. I'm like, how long have you been doing this? They're like, never. Perfect. <laughs> Let's go. Um, and it is so much fun taking first timers. Like, it's it has nothing to do with the expectation because for them they're happy catching fish don't get me wrong mm -hmm. but getting people into fish and watching that happen like you you get to relive the first time over and over and over like oh shit this is actually happening like i'm hooked up and i don't know what to do with my hands <laughs> and I mean, everybody turns into Ricky Bobby and I, <laughs> I love it. It is, is that just, <laughs> um, and we, we've dealt with, you know, people who they have the rainbow cast and you mm -hmm. know what, after a while they just make it work. And it's like, we're, we're going to hone in on your stuff in the meantime, but like, we want to get you into fish at the same time. Like right. that, that's kind of why you're here. Yeah. Um, and the, the hardest thing is to get people to trust you as a, like, you, you know what you're talking about, especially when it comes to the three letter word, everybody is tired of saying set. <laughs> like <laughs> that wasn't the fish that was bottom. Like, oh, I watched it eat, man. Like it, it is there. Trust me. It, it's, it's a fish. Um, and I, I, I don't really get aggressive with people and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's not about that. Like you should be yeah. out there enjoying your time. Exactly. But there was one kid, he's sitting there and he came walking up. He's like, man, you know, the last time we went out, like it was, it was rough. I was like, yeah, I know. Try and catch that fish right there. And he's got a little indicator on him. The fly landed. I just told my buddy this today. The fly landed and the indicator's cruising along the surface and the fly's just trailing behind it and the fish ate it and he's watching the indicator and i'm like that 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 and guy's like Whoo. he's like 
I just, I was like, I, it literally, you watched it eat the fly. Like it, it, it's okay. Like, yeah, don't, don't get fixated on the indicator or nothing. Like just, just have a good time with it. And he's like, that's, I didn't feel it though. I'm like, you're not going to man. Like that's yeah. not about the feeling. Um, it is so much fun to watch that revelation with people. And then it, there's that moment of lifting the rod to set the hook. People forget to do three things. Breathe, blink, and I mean, possibly some other bodily functions that have to be contained somewhat consciously. <laughs> and everybody has that, and they just kind of freeze up and it's like, yeah, that's that's the set. That's what you're looking for. And when they start to pick up on that, like taking first timers is so much fun. And I, I mean, I don't know if I'll get tired of it because it is it's hilarious to me. Like, and it's nothing to be mean or like at other people's expense, but it is so much more enjoyable when people get that aha realization of like, Oh shit, this is going to be expensive. Like, <laughs> yeah, join the dark side. We definitely lied about having cookies, man, but like you're in it now. All right. So you mainly fish on the spring river, right? So what all species do y'all, do y'all got up there? How much time do you have? Uh, however long you want. <laughs> okay. Um, as far as whatever people want to consider fighting fish species, like your brim species, as far as like bluegill, long ear, red ear, pumpkin mm-hmm. seed, you know, go the gamut with that. Fine. Green sunfish. Um, we have river red horse, golden red horse, hog suckers, which I'm just going to go ahead and say it now. If you want to catch a world record fish. Come to the Ozarks, catch a hog sucker. The world record is one pound, 12 ounces. I've had clients hook up to one and they're like, what is this? And it's like, it, <laughs> it's kind of like a river Roomba, but it's got a little extended butthole for a mile. Like, we, we don't know. They're a cool fish, man. They're supposed to be here. They're like, oh, and it's like this almost two pound fish. And I'm like, you can submit that for a world record. They're like, I don't want that attached to my name at all. Like, Okay. <laughs> but I think they are a fascinating fish. I love them. Um, so we have sucker species. We have pickerel. We have, which I don't know, man. I mean, it, we had that conversation about pickerel earlier. And most of the ones we're catching, they're going to be like anywhere from 10 to 12 inches, like yeah. nine. It, it, you can find giants. Don't get me wrong. But yeah, I don't know. Um, we have stock trout. We have bows. And browns. Um, we do have some hybrid species of cut bow. Mm-hmm. There were, I, I want to say, don't quote me, there were Bonneville cut cutthroat um, that were stocked years ago. And I don't know if it was something with the harvesting that had removed the Bonneville cuts or if it was return rates. We don't know, but they no longer deal with cutthroat. But you can find those like odd shaped rainbows that have really weird colorations and just nasty teeth. And like they have yellow slashes up underneath their gill plates. And we just, we know them as cut those. Um, we have large mouth, small mouth, excuse me, Kentucky's. Um, we have carp, we have walleye, which if anybody knows where any walleye are on the spring river, Hit a brother up, like <laughs> I want to catch walleye so freaking bad, so bad. You and everybody else, I'm like we. <laughs> it, it is such a hard fish to catch on the fly, at least. Dude, you know, my buddy it, caught a hog of a freaking walleye up on the white a couple months ago. Yeah, and they've been out there fishing. It was tough fishing, and they weren't catching anything. And he looked into something. And he's like, "Dude, this has to be the brown. This has to be the brown." The guy he was with was like. Dude, that's definitely the brand. That's the fish we've been fishing for. He pulls it up. It's a freaking walleye. Dude. <laughs> he said it was freaking massive. And I was like, dude, and everybody was kind of giving him hell about it. But he's like, dude, I mean, y'all can't say nothing. I caught, caught a big walleye, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. I'm, and that's another thing. Like, we we have goggle eyes, so like your rock bass, shadow bass, whatever people want to call them. Um, we've caught crappie. We've caught white and black crappie. Really? Um, it, yeah, it is a weird river. It is the only natural cold water way, cold water way in the state of Arkansas, to my knowledge. Uh, we are fed by the 10th largest spring in the world. 
Uh, on average flow, it's roughly 8 million gallons of water plus or minus per hour. Oh, um, wow. It, it's a lot of water and it comes out of a big ass hole in the ground. Um, it's a 75 foot crash spring for the geology nerds out there. Um, it, it pumping 58 degree water. Does it stay that way the whole way? Absolutely not. But it is such, I can nerd out on this all day. It is such a fascinating place. And for the, the folks at home that like to go by weight, uh, it, I did the math. And if my math is correct, it's roughly 1.2 million pounds of water that come over this, uh, old decommissioned, uh, power, or it's, it's a dam, rather, dam one over in the state park per second. If I'm not mistaken, but I went to public school and I'm an idiot. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a lot of water. It's a super neat place. And I, it's special, man. Like it, there's something about being in water that, you know, turns your shit inside out. Like it, it, it's cold. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. it, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have athlete's foot anymore. Like it's healing. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it, call it what you will. Dude, I freaking love spring-fed rivers. So I grew up in San Mar, well, near San Marcos, Texas. And mm -hmm. San Marcos, Texas has a San Marcos River that starts from a spring there. And it's the only university in the nation that has a spring-fed river start on campus. And okay. uh, so there's, it's, it's pretty, I mean, the water, water's crystal clear. It's a warmer spring. So I think it's like, if I'm not mistaken, 70 or 72 degrees year-round in the wintertime. We go okay. and do midnight swims and stuff like that. Um, polar plunges, you know, it'll be yeah. 20 degrees outside and you go out there and you go jump in 70 degree water. Um, there's native species of, uh, Texas wild rice that that's the only place in the world that it grows. Um, really? there was actually the San Marcos, uh, Gambrugia, which was a, a, a species of mosquito fish, unfortunately went extinct in 2023, I think maybe 2024. Um, but there's, okay. there's a few species of, of, uh, fauna or of fish and, and flora that, are endemic to there. So pretty cool okay. place. I used to geek out on all sorts of stuff like that just because it was a spring fed river and I freaking love right. it. And that's, you know, where I grew up, but there's just something about spring fed rivers that are freaking amazing. It, it is like you said, with endemic species, I mean, we have an endemic crawfish. We have, you know, according to Arkansas game and fish, there's the extirpated Ozark hellbender that was supposed to be on the spring river. Mm -hmm. Um, there is, uh, what else do we have? You got the Elgarg bass that's up there and, and different waterways up there, right? Yes. Uh, I believe that's more south of us, but yeah, there are Ozark bass around here. Um, the, the uniqueness of spring fed rivers and endemic species. I mean, we, we touched on conservation earlier that the importance of those, it, it's understated in a lot of facets and like it, it took my smooth brain a while to, to figure out why, you know, the stepping stones and keystone species. Like I sucked in school when it came to science biology. So I still probably suck as an adult, but at least now I'm willing to learn. Um, and you find out like, Oh, we have an endemic crawfish species, right? Well, that's supposed to be there. Like that's what the waterway has supported for however many years. Mm -hmm. And then now we have the Louisiana red crawfish, which is a much larger, I mean, it's a damn river lobster. They're, yeah. they're huge. And then people are like, Oh, it's crawfish. Like, yeah, it's crawfish. They eat the same things. They outcompete one another. And then they start to outcompete themselves. Now you have whatever they're eating after they've outcompeted themselves, if nothing else eats that, whatever it is, like it spirals, it throws the ecosystem off, off balance. Yep. Um, and when people hear about like these little tiny things like mosquito fish, I mean, that's a prime example. It's a forage fish. They also yep. eat mosquito larvae. So if people don't know, like you want those things around. Yeah. Plain and simple. They're supposed to be here. And it, human beings are the worst critters on planet earth but we're also the only ones who can kind of fix our our food bars so yeah. it's it's up to you know getting people together and getting like-minded to understand and not scream into an echo chamber but be willing to have the conversations in regards to conservation absolutely you know it, it's not just about catch and release it's about good fishing practices 
if you are doing catch and release, what's safe handling, you know? And I, I forget where I heard it, but somebody was like, how long can a fish hold its breath? And they're like, I don't know. It's like fish don't have lungs. Like the second you take it out of the water, now it's it's dying, essentially. It's starving for the oxygen that's supposed to get from the water. Yeah. Um, so safe handling practices, like everybody wants to talk about keeping wet. Listen, if you go on my Instagram, whatever it is, you will find there are plenty of pictures of people holding fish out of the water. Yes. Just because they swim off strong doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to survive. It's it's the ethics. Don't overfight a fish. Don't don't you know be responsible. Um, if you are going to harvest fish, do that responsibly as well. I mean, there's slot limits because people typically much smarter than folks like us have sat there, studied this to make sure that there are things in place to be like, hey, this is what's sustainable. And even though, like, we don't have a native trout species, to my knowledge, in the Ozarks, like, trout are one of the biggest deals around here. Now, yeah. granted, I have one of the softest spots in my heart for smallmouth bass. I mean, if you want to talk about something that if Mike Tyson was a fish, like, every, you would go for the smallmouth bass that has a face tattoo. Like, they <laughs> fight hard, man. And I freaking love smallmouth. They're so much fun. And they're supposed to be here. So then you get the people that are like, well, I, I harvest smallmouth bass. And it's like, cool. It hurts my heart a little bit. We have a friend and she loves to say it. I, I love this woman a bit. She goes, you know, smallmouth bass give you erectile dysfunction, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> ooh, I got to use that. I'm going to have to steal that. Oh, it, it is gold. So, Leslie, that's – thank you. <laughs> um it's to have species that are supposed to be there. And since the smallmouth is so slow growing and with the growth of fishing, like you look at how many people, especially during COVID had gravitated toward being outside. Like, you know, they walked out and started singing Aladdin. It was it Aladdin, the whole new world thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, the Oh shit. World. You know, they're exactly. <laughs> they're like, Oh, there's, there's a, there's a place outside of my front porch. Like, yeah, dude, like get after it. Yeah, And then they find things like fishing or they re rekindle the love for something. And it's like, yeah. Now there's going to be more people that found that love. Yeah, there's going to be more impact on fish. But we can do this responsibly and, you know, with efforts, love them or hate them from stocking efforts. Whether it be, you know, native fish species and then stocking non-native species from an economical standpoint is super important because that brings in license sales it brings in it brings people to the state to purchase things that you know go into conservation not just of stocking that fish exactly so there's always the moral gray areas we're not perfect and we're not going to be but we can at least try to leave whatever corner of paradise you call home water better than mm. you found it because I mean, we we touched on it earlier of like, you know, if you want to undertake something under conservation um, and do a project and get involved, it, you're not going to fix the world overnight. You, you're probably not even going to fix the world or see drastic changes potentially in your lifetime. Yeah. But the groundwork has been set. And so long as it's adhered to, there will be changes generations down the line that people don't realize you are setting up the future for the good old days. Even though, like, you love the fishing you're in, or if it's changed and isn't as good, and you can do something and set it back to that potentially, or make it better, make it sustainable. I mean, we're we're not going to get any of this stuff back, and if we keep yeah. taking away and polluting riverways, then it's not going to get better. So, I think getting people together to have those hard conversations and realize, yeah, anglers make an impact, and that's what we're here for. Yeah, exactly. In the same way people demonize hunters because they're like, it's unethical to kill an animal. Well, name me any critter in nature that dies nicely. Yeah, You know, there's no such thing as dying of old age. So th there's a, a lot going on with that that I feel like there's a lot of misinformation going out there. And so if mm -hmm. you don't mind, I'd like to kind of dive yeah. into that a little more in terms of conservation and hunting and fishing and stuff like that. Yeah. So us as fly fishermen, we're known for catch and release. That's that's majority mm -hmm. of the time what we do. Um, with that being said, we 
I mean, I don't know about you, but I do, you know, occasionally harvest fish. And the thing is just doing it responsibly. Hunting is the same thing. But I don't know anybody else in the entire civilization of the United States that has a self-imposed tax that they agree with. You know, right. Outdoorsmen are the only ones that have a self-imposed tax that they will happily pay because they know that they will keep this resource for generations to come. And that yeah. goes into, I mean, licenses and permits and stuff like that goes to obviously paying salaries for the biologists that are doing studies on, on how to make stuff last and um, how to have, you know, healthier water, better ecosystem for the fish, better ecosystem for, you know, whether it be a white-tailed deer up in the Ozarks and, and you know, bringing back the the white oak or the red oak in certain areas. I mean, it goes deep into the science and, and stuff that these biologists have degrees in to understand what makes this ecosystem thrive. And yep. I don't know of any other situation in the government or in the U S where people will actually say, okay, Hey, we need to pay taxes because nobody wants to pay taxes, but this is something that we can make last for generations to come. And we impose that tax on ourselves to make it, to make it do so. Um, right. You know, you touched a little bit earlier on the smallmouth bass. I don't know how much you know about smallmouth bass, but we've had a previous guest on that. I kind of picked his brain a little bit. We didn't talk about it on the podcast, um, but do you know much about the different, I guess, subspecies of smallmouth bass in the Ozarks? The Neosho, the Wachita, Common. And the northern, yep, yeah, the Northern. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, that's another thing you were talking about, the crawfish. Okay, we got the Louisiana red crawfish coming up here, and it's competing with the indigenous crawfish up in the Ozarks. Well, it's kind of the same thing with the Neosho and, and the Wachita bass that yeah. are subspecies of smallmouth bass that are now interbreeding with Northerns just because they're bigger and that's just what they've been, you know, stocking everything with and doing supplemental yep. stockings in these waterways, mainly in the Illinois watershed and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's stuff like that. That's kind of why our podcast is here. We want to get this information out there because we know that people aren't going to go out there and say, you know what, this smallmouth bass, I don't know if it's native. So let's go ahead and run some genetic sequencing on it and make sure that it actually belongs here. Nobody's going to do that. But if right. we can get that information out there in a YouTube video where someone's driving down the road and just wants some, you know, ear noise, and, you know, we just happen to have a video about it. Why not get that out there and get it something that's more easily digestible for somebody, for the everyday listener that's not going to go and read a course study. So um, yeah. there's just a lot more that goes into it. And I feel like there's a lot of misinformation or people just don't have ways to get that information. So the fact that you're passionate about it and you work in the industry as a guide, like if, if you're willing, I'd like to dive a little bit more into that. I mean, so I actually, are you familiar with the Native Fish Coalition? Yes. Okay, so I, I, I guess I sit with the Native Fish Coalition. Um, we got some dogs running through, so don't mind them. But uh, come here. Oh, never, never mind. My my dog hates me. Maybe. Um, so the Native Fish Coalition is something that it, it was refreshing. I guess is the only word I can use because when you know it was brought to my attention from a friend of mine. And she's like, you know, I really do think that this organization aligns with your your values. And it's like, if it does, it does. If it doesn't, then okay. And there's other organizations out there that, you know, I'm, they may not. And that's fine. I, You know, we all want a common goal, which is yeah. typically clean air, clean water, you know. And then you hear the people say that and you look at all the other stuff and it's like, well, it doesn't seem like that's what you're about. It's like. When an organization said that, hey, we want to we want to vet you and see where you stand on certain topics and make sure you're not using this as something for like a resume and be like, oh, well, I'm a part of so and so organization and yeah. you actually care. Um, that was something that was so much more refreshing to me to hear from an organization that showed me that they do care. Yeah. Um, and the fact that they're not an angling based organization because the founder, Bob Mallard, he, he said it like we are the biggest as anglers, the biggest detriment to fish, you know, people that fish or harvest fish. We're, we're one of the biggest detriments. Um, with that being said, going back to the deer hunter or whatever, like we also care so much about them because we enjoy this, you know, primarily as, like you said, fly fishermen do catch and release, you know, the responsible practices we, we tend to see a little bit more as commonplace. 
Um, you're not you're not getting the people that you know just oh I cranked this bass off you know cast him from a forty foot bridge and I just I reeled it up this thing with my ultralight rod and the drag's screaming three quarters of the way up and it's like ah <laughs> it's three feet off the water now like it's coming and then they get it up there and it's like one eye's twitching and they just kind of huck it back and it's turtle food now yeah um so the safe handling practices and understanding the water. The, the demographic, not just the water, but the habitat and making sure that things are in place to but these things can't help themselves from our impact. Yeah. And being a part of, you know, an angling industry, like taking those first timers, you can kind of learn them through a fire hose and be like, this is why this is also important and start to relay some of that information because a lot of people. You know, there's people that get confused. I think a sucker's a carp. It's it's easy to do. You know, mm-hmm. can you tell the difference in a Black River walleye and a, a regular walleye? Can you tell that, like you said, no one's going to go do genetic testing. Could you tell the difference in a Neo show and a watch top bass? Like, to the untrained eye, you're going, it's a small mouth or, you know, mean mouths. You know, people are like, oh, it's just a green small mouth. Like, yeah, it, it's a subspecies. Yeah, like getting that information out there and saying, hey, this is important to pay attention to because you have the confusion around what fish are supposed to be in this river. As far as we know, I mean, I'm not going to assume your age or nothing, but we're right around the same age. Yeah. And if we are, then you should be in as much pain as I am. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> getting getting old ain't for the ain't for the week is what I was told. And I'm like. Shit, man, I got a long way to go. Right. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to live past um, 70. I'm 31 and I'm hurting. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're going to regret that stupid shit like, fuck you, on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in our lifetime, like, we, we would grow up with some of these waterways having trout, and that's what we know. Yeah. Historically, they weren't there. Now, it, also historically, we're not going to have herds of buffalo like we did. You know, it's yeah. just, it's not possible. There's not the land to support that. We've changed waterways through impounding. We've changed so many things. But can we make things cohesive? Can we make things, you know, better? Or are we going to continue to let them spiral if they are spiraling? Because those species like alligator gar that were poached to near extinction, mm-hmm. you know, we have sturgeon, which were used for eggs and then. At the same time, too, I mean, hell, when they were floating down the Mississippi in paddle boats, they were just chucking them up on the banks. And then they'd use them for coal to go fire these steamboats. And it, you look at how much impact the human population has created. Now we have an opportunity with platforms like this to at least get the gears going in somebody's head and have the conversation spark an interest. Like you said, somebody who's just going to drive down the road and potentially listen to this, thank you, because you you might take an interest in this and be like, huh, I'm going to look into this. And that might be all they do. Yeah. But that might come up again, you know, as a, a blip in their consciousness, you know, a month from now, two months from now. I'm like, I want to research this. And now like, hey, that that's what got them outside and fishing or that's what got them fishing for for darters, you know, and going micro fishing. and there's new species yet to be discovered and it's going to take biologists. It's going to take, you know, people going out and being like, Hey, I caught this. And someone's gonna be like, Oh shit, I've never seen one of those before. Is this something that we should research or is, is this something that's worth pursuing? So the advent of social media, as good as it is, or as bad as it is, there's that double-edged sword and any outdoor industry professional, what, whatever people want to consider guides or influencers or whatever, they they carry a voice, and it's something that you're typically screaming in an echo chamber. Like like minded people follow like minded people. Yeah, you know. But the fact that it can spark a conversation to give fuel for you know, not just an argument, and that's a terrible word to use, but shift the conversation, learn, learn something else to say, or change the narrative and be like, 
well, let's look at this. Is this is this dam that's not being used anymore? You know, what can we do about it? Or this dam that's being used, if it's cutting off a, a, an endemic species or an anadromous species, you know, you start to see more people caring about things. Like, I, I get shit in my news feed about, like, you know, derailments out west of trains that now dump salmon. And I think it was into the Columbia River. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh, shit. And people are like, cool, more fish. Like, yeah, <laughs> that, that's also kind of a problem. Yeah. Step one, there's a damn train in the river. Step two, like, what if those weren't supposed to be there? Exactly. So, I mean, now there might just be a whole bunch of salmon that are like, shit, we're supposed to find a train. <laughs> and we might have a new species of, of fish that just like, they're they're hobos. <laughs> oh yeah but you're absolutely right though i mean getting people out there to do it you know you talked about it a little bit when you're saying seeing the gears going in in somebody's first time out there fishing and you get somebody doing something like that something new and they end up loving it well people take care of things that they love so uh you know hats off to you as a guide getting first timers out there and getting them to enjoy the outdoors and enjoy doing the sport that we love, that we would love to pass down. And, um, you know, it's, it, it just takes people getting out there and doing it and and finding something they enjoy doing, whether it be hunting, whether it be fishing, whether it be hiking and kayaking, but if they're getting out there and doing it and it's something they enjoy, they're going to be more likely to take care of it. You know, of course you get people in the cities that are, you know, they're going to go and they're going to throw the trash out the window because that's what they've always known. Um, and then you get people like us that every time we go out somewhere, like we're picking up that trash that other people are leaving trash that comes down the river, trash that people leave while they're camping. Um, I went camping over at 10 killer state park in Oklahoma a couple weeks back and yeah, I I picked up three grocery bags full of trash that was just at the campsite. And I I figured, Oh, well maybe they just, you know, I, I probably checked in right after somebody checked out or something and then ended up going down below the dam and uh trash there and then i went up on the upper illinois and there's trash there and you know I, next thing i know i'm the bed of my truck just full of trash i'm picking stuff up right but there's just some people that just don't care but then you get those that do they want to make this last and so the more people that we get out there doing it are going to be more people that care about it and more people that want to preserve yeah. it so i agree with that 100 percent. you know and i think there's a lot to be said you know we're, what was that stand-up comedian he's like we we keep bringing the outside inside like you know oh we're we're supposed to have like plants in our lives and now all of a sudden we have plants <laughs> in our houses it's like we just keep bringing the outside inside and like you find people when they get outside like it is therapeutic you get stressed go go find a river to sit next to mm-hmm. um organizations like casting for recovery and real recovery um they hit real close to home for me um i i'm not ashamed to admit i will shamelessly tear up if not full-blown cry every year casting for recovery Mm -hmm. um i i love the organization i love their mission what it stands for and this past year um i i thought it was absolutely incredible because the 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 lady who went with me she'd never caught a fish before and i I promise this is going to foster back uh, into the conversation we had, she, uh, <laughs> we're, we're driving out there and I was like, so what, what's your experience with fish? She's like, I'm, I've never caught a fish. And I'm like, oh, like, <laughs> okay, pressure's on. Um, so I, we, we get out there and I told her, I was like, you're more than likely going to lose your first fish. Like you, you're, you're going to hook up. You're going to wind up with the Ricky Bobby hands. You're going to white knuckle that thing, like hold that line so hard to that grip that, I mean, if you were to hook one of those salmon train salmon things like that, that Norfolk Southern can be hauling ass down. The, you, you're going to pull that train off the tracks. So you're going to hold that line. So tight. <laughs> She's like, How do you know? I was like, I, I've just seen it. So we rode up there kind of as a group. And I looked at my buddy and I, we're pulling into the parking lot at Norfolk. And I looked at my buddy. I was like, Hey, are we waiting on anybody? Like, do we have anything to do? And he's like, Nope. And all like six foot two plus, you know, 300, whatever, 260. Well, I, I'm a fat dude. We go <laughs> hauling out of the car. I grab the shit and go tearing down the stairs. And we're just, I mean, just trucking through the water. 
And I'm like, we're going to get to that hole. Like, you got to get a fish. And so we're walking through. And it didn't take her very long. Like, you know, she started off. It seemed almost unsure of herself, but she's doing everything right. And then she makes a cast. It drifts it beautifully. This little indicator has this little hesitation that she's learning like that, that, that just subtle set on it. And so she's boom, boom. Next thing you know, she's hooked up that, that bottom tick, that fish tick that she'd missed a couple of times before it starts pulling back and she gets wide eyed and that thing pops off. She goes, oh. and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> she's like, what? And I was like, you said it first. She's like, what? And I was like, <laughs> You drop the first half bomb, like, we're going to have fun now. And <laughs> it, I mean, just my face hurt from laughing and smiling so much. And they called like the, the 15 minute warning and she's hooked up, but like there's, it, it's cooperation on both parts and like, it's the learning process. And we're walking up there and I'm like, stop. What? And I'm like, there is a giant fish right at our feet. Like what? And we we backed off this shoulder just to just a touch, and it wound up getting hung. And she's hanging on to this rod, and the fish ain't doing shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's just sitting on the bottom, like, huh? Lunch today's stiffer than last. Like I just. <laughs> She starts to steer into it just a touch, man, and that thing about started on fire. I mean, it tore straight across this shoal and jumped out of the water. It was a beautiful fish. I mean, thick old red band on it, dark colored up rainbow. And I, 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 it was one of those moments like I, it is burned into my brain. I don't have words for it. And then you saw what every fisherman has seen if you've done it long enough. And it was that line, just go. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, I don't know what happened. I was like, you got a fishing story. Like what? Yep. I was like, yeah, that, that is the one that got away. And it, then I kind of looked down. I was like, so 15 minutes. I was like, yeah, no, that's the first 15 minute warning. Like, yes. So we go walking down. <laughs> And she hooks up again. And this time it was like, there is no way this thing is not going to wind up in the net. Like it is, it's going to happen. And really that's that moment of, you know, her holding this fish, like her first fish, the smile in the background. That's what it was about. I mean, you mm -hmm. cannot fake that. You cannot replicate it. And it's emotional, man. Like it, it's one of those that it's a day that I don't think any of us that were involved are ever going to forget. And the best part about it is after all was said and done, she shot me a text and it was like, what kind of fish is this? And it was a, uh, a pumpkin seed. I'm like, you're still after it. Like, <laughs> this is what it's about like yes like keep going keep learning and she's now like this is what i do like i i go out and i enjoy time you know with my family i'm fishing i'm i'm enjoying this and i'm enjoying the learning process and that's something that you just there are no words i mean it's it's cool to see that no matter who you are what your background is people are still willing to learn. And I think fostering that interest and having, having something to a positive outlet, it is so much more important, man. Like it, absolutely. those are the times that like, I, I wish I could just frame in my mind and like, I, you can't forget them, but like, it's, it's an emotional roller coaster. And I, yeah, I, to see somebody so, so head over heels with something that we've all come to love. And it's, yeah, we joke about coming back, you know, or coming to the dark side of fishing. But like, it, it really does open up a lot of doors. 
And it, it seems like it's more of a positive outlet for a lot of people instead of going out and, you know, spending your winters when it's too cold to, you know, go outside or, you know, do whatever. And like, you don't want to bundle up or the weather sucks or, and you can, you can tie flies, you can research this new passion, you can, whatever it is, like it, it doesn't have to be fishing, but yeah, it, if it is like, that's obviously what I've revolved my life around. Yeah. It's so much more incredible to, to watch. And yeah, I, uh, I absolutely love everything about it. And that's, like I said, one of those experiences that I, I, I don't think I could forget even if I ever wanted to, like I'm, it is burned into my brain. And there's a few experiences like that, that I believe all of us have had, you know, um, I taught a young man how to fly fish, uh, about a year ago. And the first time that he got a cast and, and I could see it in his eyes because I'd taught him, I wasn't letting him release any line. I just wanted him to hold yeah. the line and go ahead and start working on his cast. And the first time that I told him, okay, release that line and it zipped out and you get that little tick when it clicks once, once, you know, you let all your slack out and I could just see that smile on his face and that is going to be burned in my memory forever. Cause he's the first yeah. person that I ever taught how to fly fish. And it was just, it's moments like that, that are just, they're going to live in my mind rent free and I'm always going to remember them. And it's just, it, it's, it's awesome to be able to teach somebody something that you know that they're going to enjoy. And you're absolutely right. Like, so I'm one of those guys that I enjoy fishing when it's cold, you know, I'll go out there and I'm having to dip my rod in the water to try to get the ice off the guides. You know, I'm one absolutely. of those guys. Not everybody's like that. Um, no. but in the wintertime, there's plenty of fly fishing films you can watch. If you just want to sit next to the fireplace and watch something on the TV, um, you can obviously tie flies. Wait, you a fireplace? Uh, no, I, I got a little electric <laughs> one, <laughs> but I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can do in the wintertime revolving yeah. around fly fishing as well. Um, and so there's, I mean, tying flies is one of my, I need to get behind the vice a little more. I don't, I don't get behind it enough, but um, there's so much more that you can do in the wintertime. If, if you're not a person that likes being outdoors, uh, yeah. I'm the guy that I'm out there. I don't care how cold it is. A couple years ago yeah. on Christmas day, I was out there. My kids were with their mom on Christmas day. I had them on Christmas Eve and yeah. I'm out there fly fishing at the dam, 35 mile per hour backwind and uh, got a one aught and a size two hook both into my shoulder, double hauling an <laughs> articulated yeah. streamer past the barb in both of them. And oh, uh, yeah my muscle was just twitching and there were some guys actually there working on the dam. I was fishing at the dam and uh, they come out and I said, Hey, I said, I weird question. Do y'all have any lineman, lineman's pliers or anything? And they're like, uh, yeah, we got some nines. I said, uh, do you think you can push this hook through? And they're like, what do you mean? I said, I got these two big hooks on my shoulder and uh, I don't need you to take them out. I just need you to get that barb through. And one guy was like, man, I can't all throw up. And the other guy grabbed it and he's horsing. I mean, he's pulling my shoulder. He's a big guy. You know, I'm, I'm five eleven, maybe 190 pounds. And he's I yeah. mean, horsing on me, pushing me around. And, uh, I just see my skin stretching, stretching, stretching. And it yep. finally goes through and my muscles just twitching like crazy. About a 15 minute drive home. I got home, was able to clip it off and pull it out. So yeah, I got myself some piercings on Christmas day a couple of years ago. <laughs> that's dude yeah it was freaking uh, awesome <laughs> in fact i got videos of it somewhere on my phone but uh you gotta send those to me man that's that's dude, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> that's like uh um I, I was talking to a buddy of mine i was like man i've I've never been shot before but i have been hit in the back of the head with a tungsten bead like right behind <laughs> the i'm like i'm pretty sure that's a close second like right. you see stars you kind of get dizzy you don't know if you should be pissed off or thanking God you're alive. <laughs> right. I mean, there's been, I, I had one guy, he hooks up and he kind of turns this, this trout into a little, little puppet. Like, you know, you get people that pull in the leader and it's like, they get so excited and I'm holding on to this fish and I grab the hook or I grab the leader first so I can pull a little bit of slack. And I'm trying to like walk them through, calm them down a little bit. Like let's, take about 10% off there, squirrely Dan. Like, I know you jazzed <laughs> up, but we're going to make this work with this fish back in the water. And the fish shook, and that hook just drove right into the meat of my hand. Ugh. Now, there was a crucial moment of realizing there's now like a size 8 hook 
buried in the meat of my hand, like, I mean, into the bend, and me trying to catch a fish that's falling. I'm doing one of these numbers, like, he's freaking out, like, picking the rod up, like, oh, my goodness. And he's like, your hand, I'm like, the fish. And I'm trying to catch it, but I'm hooked up to the damn rod. And he's like, your hand, your hand. I'm like, the fish. Just walked over, and, like, I get done. That's going to hurt, you know. I, <laughs> earlier this year, I wound up burying a hook I took out of a dead trout. I had a couple guys out. I'm sitting there, and, I mean, I I stuck that hook. I mean, it came clear out of the fish and into my thumb, and I'm like, oh, it's going to get infected. And, like, I pulled it out, and I'm, like, trying to force it to bleed. And you're sitting here like, man, the kid's like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm just peachy. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you know, just checking my blood type, man. Like, you know, <laughs> making sure it's still whatever it says on my birth certificate. And get home, your thumb swelled up like that. And you're like, ah, I'll be all right. Like, it, it's just sepsis. You'll be okay. Right. Dude, there's something about trout slime that does not feel good in a freaking no, wound. <laughs> that and carp. carp oh, I haven't too. done carp yet. How's that feel? Yeah, it, it, it didn't feel great. <laughs> I'd much rather have a clean hook go into me than a freaking dirty one. I'll tell you that. And that, you know, you get all the guys that are like, oh, fish barbless flies. Like, yeah, it is so much easier on the fish. But the likelihood of you burying a hook in yourself, like, I've been doing this long enough. Like, I don't give a shit. Like, it's still going to happen. If it, There's two types of fly fishermen. Those that have hooked themselves and those that haven't done it yet. Like, or it, those that are it, dirty freaking liars. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, three. I mean, it, well, I, I think even the dirty liars, like, they might hook themselves good enough that they're like, okay, yeah, that no, that counts. Yeah, and it only counts one. if you hook. <laughs> yeah, like, it only counts if you hook past the bar. Mm-hmm. Like, or where the barb should be. Yeah. But that's why you fish barbless flies. Like, it's not for the fish necessarily. It, it's for you. They come out of you so much easier. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I can't name as many fish that I've lost due to using barbless hooks, but I can name the times I've been hooked with the barbless fly. And uh, I remember those <laughs> a lot more because yeah. it's a lot easier to get out when there's no barb. Um, you know, you'll, you'll forget some of the fish that you lost, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a lot easier on yourself and on your clothes. And I mean, it's inevitable. You're going to hook something, whether it be a hat, a shirt, your pants, you know, your waders. Oh, that's the worst. Springing a your leak buddy. of waders because you're hooking yourself. Yeah, your buddy. <laughs> so I, I got a good buddy of mine. Uh, he was he was roll casting, so I felt comfortable sitting behind him. Mm-hmm. And I'm just kind of propped up on this rock, and he's kind of throwing. I don't know if they were like he was doing some single hand spike stuff because we had trees behind us, but uh-huh. he did like this wild pickup, and he skated the fly just far enough back that it picked up that anchor. And when he sent it forward, I mean, it just kicked around. So I got my sunglasses on, and it bounced off my sunglasses and buried itself, like, right. I mean, you're talking underneath the orbital socket Uh, or whatever your eyebrow is. I don't know if that's still your orbit. I don't know. I went to public school again, man. I don't know. (laughs) But I grabbed a hold of the leader, and I was like, dude, if you move that rod, I'm going to kick your ass so hard. And he turned around and this dude just went white. And he's like, oh my God, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, dude, I'm fine. I just wanted to make sure you weren't going to send that thing off and take my eyebrow with it. Did it Did it go past the barb into your skin? No. That, that's good. No. That's a good place. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess I wasn't hooked, but it, it, was, it could have been. Yeah. Well, I mean, if it's close enough to the eye, I don't care if it goes past the barb or not, you're hooked. <laughs> it's by yeah, your damn like, eye. Was, <laughs> that could have been bad. <laughs> there was definitely a, a butthole pucker of about 8.4. Like, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say watertight because you didn't have enough time to realize the gravity of the situation, but like, I pulled it out. I wouldn't matter nothing, but it was like, yeah, that was cool. Like, keep fishing. He's like, I don't know if I want to. Like, I ain't mad, bro. Like, just. Keep keep doing you. It's okay. I still sat there too. Guess it yeah. never learned. Just keep roll casting. Don't let that anchor come up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Damn it. Well, man, I didn't realize that we've been uh recording for over an hour now. So uh I guess it's kind of time to start closing her down. I hate to because I feel like we're barely even getting started, but uh no maybe shit. this just means we need to do a part two sometime. But 
uh, where can people find you? You know, on Instagram and stuff like that, or, or book with you. Just uh, go ahead and plug Instagram, yourself. Instagram, Facebook, Goose Guides Flies. You can look me up by my name, Josh Darguzis. Um, I mean, as of right now, hit me up directly. We're working on some stuff to uh, to change that. But you know, I I don't care who you go with. I, I don't like you know go out. I don't care if you hire a guy. I don't care if you you buy a, a forty dollar rod from Walmart go out and just experience this. If you haven't already, if I don't care how pretentious and douchey it seems like try it at least once to know it's not for you. And I agree with that. I don't care if it's not fly fishing. I don't care what it is. Just take the time to be outside and realize that these places that we all enjoy, like they, they need to be protected, man. Like, Obviously, you know, you got organizations like the Native Fish Coalition, you know, go go check them out. Their mission statement, Arkansas is a new chapter. So, I mean, we've been we've been looking for projects we've been and we've been dealing with some and getting the ball rolling on some things that like we're we're taking steps toward making, like I said, our little slices of heaven just that much better. So. It doesn't matter to who you go through. Just get out there, man. Go, go get after it. Go enjoy it, and go write your own damn stories. And go, yep. go hook yourself. <laughs> like <laughs> past the barb. Yep, you got to go past barb. It doesn't count unless it's in your eye, and then unless you know. it's in your eye, your <laughs> lip, your neck, um, your nuts. <laughs> yeah, don't hook yourself in the paint like that. Ooh. If if you do, fly fish with clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> good point and if you do it with clothes on then you're talented <laughs> yeah, right? but yeah um, i agree with that get outside go hike and go kayak and go camp and go hunt and go fish and just get out there uh reset that circadian clock get in touch with nature you'll feel a lot better and uh for those of y'all that have made it to the end we appreciate y'all watching and we'll catch y'all next time this has been wildlife outdoors thanks for listening follow us on facebook at wildlife outdoors and on instagram at wild dot life dot outdoors let's go live life on the wild side